Hello everyone, this is John Mark Johnson Jr. again, and today we are going uh, to be discussing the first part of John chapter 3, specifically verses 1 through 15. And the reason why I'm making this video is because John chapter 3 is one of the places where the gospel message is taught very clearly. I mean, there's, of course, the gospel throughout the Bible, but there are certain points in the Bible where you have, say, a nexus, if you will, of, di of different ideas coming together and demonstrating very clearly and very plainly uh, what the gospel is all about. And John chapter 3 happens to be one of those places. Now, for those of you who might be wondering, I'm going to be reading from this book right here. This is the Greek English New Testament containing the Nestle Elan 28th edition and the English Standard Version, just in case you're wondering. And this video is um, for everyone who would be interested in what biblical historical Christians believe about the gospel. So if you're a part of, say, Inglésia and the Christo, and you want uh, to know what the Bible uh, teaches in full, going through an entire passage and seeing what it has to say, this would be pertinent to you. If you are, say, a Mormon and you want to know why biblical Christians believe what they do about uh, salvation versus what Mormonism teaches, this is for you. If you're Roman Catholic and you don't get why Protestants are the, <laughs> the way they are when it comes to the issue of salvation, those kinds of things, uh, this is for you. Okay. So let's go ahead and get into it. I'm going to uh, go ahead and start by reading all 15 verses, and then we're going to go back through, and uh, we're going to uh, break it down after that. But I like to get everything out there at first, just so that you have the entire context and the entire narrative. So let's go ahead and begin. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these, these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered, Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know, and we bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things, and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one ascends into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpents in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Okay, so that's the passage. Let's go through uh, back through and break it down and see what it's talking about. It starts out in the first couple of verses by introducing this person who's going to be having this conversation with Jesus. It says, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. That's our introduction uh, to Nicodemus. And in this brief introduction, it doesn't go into great detail about who Nicodemus is. We don't exactly get his life story and those kinds of things. But we do know a few th important things about him uh, right off the bat. First thing that it tells us is that he is a Pharisee. Now, for those of you who do not know, the Pharisees were a group within early, uh, within uh, the early Hebrew... Um, Milu, if you uh, will, um, 
with there was actually quite a few different Hebrew groups early on and one of them was called the Pharisees and the Pharisees had of course a particular set of beliefs that distinguished them from other groups like say the Sadducees or the Zealots etc etc or um, the Essenes uh, that we discover with um, that uh, provided us with the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, those kinds of groups, the Pharisees were distinct from them. And some of the things that demarcated the Pharisees were um, a belief in the supernatural, that God could do supernatural things here in this uh, life, in the here and now. They believe that miracles can and do happen, you know, in the natural right now. Um, and they also believed in uh, the resurrection of the dead on... Uh, the, um, the final in the in the final age that at the end of this or, uh, world as we know it the dead are going to be resurrected okay uh, so there is life after death uh, for Pharisees and then which wasn't true of all the groups like the Sadducees for example was basically you're you're dead you're done more or less they didn't believe in, in a resurrection in that sense Hey, but the Pharisees did believe in the resurrection. And then also the Pharisees were the beginnings of what became uh, the, uh, the basically what is now known as um, traditional Orthodox Judaism, the rabbinical uh, movement especially, um, where you have not just uh, the Old Testament scripture, but you also have uh, oral commands and laws and traditions of the elders that are passed along with them. So this is the, the person that's coming to talk to, uh, to Jesus, someone with this uh, kind of a background. And he's one of the Jewish uh, leaders, he's a ruler of uh, the Jews, and he comes to Jesus by night. And you might ask, why is he coming uh, to Jesus by night? Well, if you read the first couple of chapters of John, um, you'll note it, uh, you'll see very quickly that Jesus is a controversial, uh, controversial figure. In John chapter 2, Jesus does this great miracle. He changes water into wine at the wedding in Canaan. Okay, so great uh, miracle, and there's lots of people that are very interested in what he has to say because of that. But at the same time, also in John chapter 2, he has just chased the money changers out of uh, the temple with a whip that he made for himself. Excuse me. Sorry, my joints sometimes kind of get a little bit locked up and I'm readjusting, so sorry if that's distracting. Um, so... Jesus is a controversial figure, though. On one hand, he's a miracle worker that people like. On the other hand, he's basically saying that the standard Jewish system that exists at the time has become decadent and misguided. You're allowing money changes in the, uh, into the temple. You're making it a place of commerce instead of uh, a place of worship. Uh, he gets very upset by this. And Nicodemus is interested in what Jesus has uh, to say. But since he's a controversial figure and he's a leader of the Jews, he comes by night. And how does he uh, uh, start talking to Jesus? Well, he starts talking to Jesus as a Pharisee would. He says, Rabbi, teacher, this is fairly standard within uh, the Pharisees. That would be uh, the rabbinical movement. That would be something that they would do. Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. That is interesting. No one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. That fits right into what a Pharisee would be looking at. Remember those three main things that I talked about. Pharisees believe in the miraculous, the resurrection, and in uh, the uh, traditions uh, and laws of the elders. And so when he's uh, talking to Jesus, he's talking to him basically as to another Pharisee. Hey, Rabbi, you're, you're one of our teachers. You're one of uh, our guys, and you're doing signs just like we would expect you to do. Okay, so he's approaching him as a Pharisee. Jesus knows, uh, is looking at this, looking at what this Pharisee has in mind and how the Pharisee understands God's word, and also how to be reconciled with God. Because if you're a Pharisee, how you have good standing with God is by keeping all of the commandments. You keep all the Old Testament commandments, and you also keep the tradition of the elders, so on and so forth, to make sure that you're in a good standing with God. And Jesus hones right in on this, and the first thing that he wants to talk about is how you 
come to see uh, the kingdom of uh, God, how you come into God's group. That's what the kingdom of, uh, of God is about. How do you come into being a part of what God has established? How do you come and be a part of God's people? And Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of uh, God. And what's interesting here is that when Jesus says, unless one is born again, that word there uh, for again is actually a word with double meaning in the Greek. Let me see if I can find it in the Greek text here, because the Greek text is right next to it. Da, 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 da. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? And nothing. There it is. And nothing. And nothing is the word that has the double meaning. In some contexts, it can mean again to repeat, but it can also mean from above. And if you have a good English uh, translation, like say the ESV or the NIV, there'll usually be a little footnote down at the bottom saying that this word can be interpreted in multiple ways, as either again or from above. And this is interesting because Jesus is actually intentionally using a word that's ambiguous. It can be interpreted two ways, either again, as something that you uh, would do, something that you would be a part of, or from above, from above, meaning that it's from somebody else. And Jesus is using this ambiguous uh, verbiage to point out where this Pharisee's mind, where his conception of things is going to be. And so how is it that Nicodemus reacts when he says this? And Jesus has just said, unless one is born again or from above, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. There's two ways that Nicodemus could have interpreted it. Something uh, that I can do in the natural or something that God does in the spiritual. Those are the two options that Jesus has basically given him. And where does Nicodemus go? He says, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his, mother womb, uh, his mother's womb to be born? Where did this Pharisee go? He went to the side of what he could do in the natural. Why, how, why did Jesus uh, set him up for this? Jesus wanted to point out what his conception of salvation was, how what his conception of being right with God was versus what was actually true. He's thinking, I can be right with God by what I do. Church membership, uh, in, the, in the modern uh, case, uh, church membership could be it, uh, following all of the rules uh, that I'm supposed to, you know, keeping the word of wisdom if you're a, a Mormon, um, Oh, uh, being the ministers, if you're from Iglesia de Cristo, whatever the case happens uh, to be on that one, I'm going to go ahead and, you know, do these things, and that will make me right with God. And this is the same thing that's going through this Pharisee's mind. Okay, I keep uh, the Torah, I keep the commandments, I'm obeying uh, the tradition of uh, the elders and maintaining them. And as a Pharisee, he would have been uh, like most Pharisees, very zealous uh, for these things, very eager in these things, wanting to do right, to have that good, right relationship with God, being a very religious and moral person. And when he's told that you must be born again, that's exactly where he goes. What can I do? And he thinks, well, if I'm going to be born again, that's going to be a bit of a problem because I'm a full grown guy. I'm pretty sure I'm not going to fit in my mom anymore. That's not going to work. That's exactly where he goes. And that's where a lot of us go. When it comes to a relationship with God, we think about who God is and what his standards are. And his standards are absolute standards. I mean, read uh, the Old Testament. Read the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not. There's no wiggle room. Thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt uh, not bear uh, false testimony. Thou shalt not covet. They are absolute standards. And there's no wiggle room on them. And But the mistake that a lot of us make and this is the mistake that Jesus was getting after him uh, for, is to think that those standards in and of themselves are the means of salvation. In the Old Testament, even I think it's in uh, Leviticus, I think, I might have to look that up, but the Old Testament does say that if you can keep these things, they would be your salvation. But the problem is that none of us keeps them uh, perfectly. I mean, just think about uh, the Ten uh, Commandments. And the first four are devoted uh, are our relationship with God. The last six are our relationship with our fellow mankind. And the fact of the matter is that we don't keep them uh, perfectly. You might say, well, I've never murdered someone, and that's true. But the problem is 
that even though we necessarily haven't murdered someone, we've still thought about it. The intention is still there. Okay. And the intention is part of what makes it sinful. Okay. And Jesus even talks about uh, this in the New Testament. You know, you've heard it said, thou shalt not murder, but I tell to you, uh, I say to you that anyone who would either call his brother uh, Raka, uh, which was a, a pejorative term uh, essentially at the time, that even if you're going to insult someone uh, that you've uh, sinned. And it also he says, you know, thou shalt not commit adultery, but if you look at someone to, uh, as someone, a woman to lust after her, you've already committed adultery with her in your heart. It's always motive, motive, motive. And this isn't new to Jesus. This is an Old Testament issue as well, where the motive is weighed in addition uh, to what is actually done. In fact, in the Old Testament, the motive trumps what is actually done. For example, um, King uh, Hezekiah, during the uh, reign of King Hezekiah, they decide to reinstitute the Passover, which was a required feast in the Torah something that the Jews would have uh, to observe, or I should say at this time, the Hebrews in general would have to observe. And so he reinstitutes it. And it's you know, when they decide that they're going to reinstitute, it's really close to the time for it to be done. And so they don't have time to get everybody uh, properly ceremonially cleansed. And Hezekiah prays uh, for the people concerning this and says, and basically it says, you see God that we're not ceremonial clean. What we've actually done is not right. But you also see that we are trying uh, to uh, keep your word in this. Our motives are to do what you would ask us to do. Our motives are right. And guess what? God accepts them, even though they're not ceremonially clean. Why? Because motive trumps the individual actions, even in the Old Testament. And it's the motive behind those Ten Commandments that condemn us all. That is, yeah, we might not have murdered, but we've still had bad thoughts about our, our neighbor. We might uh, not have actually stolen something, but we might have thought that we really wanted to have it even though it wasn't ours, right? All of that is sin because it starts in the heart. And because of that, the law isn't a means of reconciliation. If we could keep it, we would uh, be perfect. But the problem is that no one keeps it because our heart from the inside out has impure motives. And this is what Jesus is uh, getting at with him. And then what he says next is all kinds of amazing. Verse 5, Jesus answered. Uh, Nicodemus has just talked about trying to be born again physically, crawling into his mother's womb. You know, how is this going to work? I've got to do something to make myself uh, right with God. I've got to do these things. And of course, Christ is going to go a very different direction with it. Like I said, he painted two directions, uh, painted two different options for Nicodemus, left him with two different options. You can be a born again, something that you can do in the natural, or you can be born from above, which is something that God uh, does in the spiritual. And Jesus uh, responds to Nicodemus' mental apprehension here. You know, how can I be born again? He's thinking in the natural, what he can do in the natural. And Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Here's this Pharisee who has been taught that the way that you have right relationship with God is you obey the commandments. And he's good at keeping the commandments, and most of the Pharisees would have been. So Nicodemus probably would fall in that A category. You know, he doesn't do things that make him ceremonial, uh, ceremonial and clean. When he is ceremonial and clean, he gets ceremonially purified like he's supposed to. He listens to the tradition of uh, the elders to make sure that he's, you know, safe in this regard. All these kinds of things. And then Jesus comes out and says, you have to be born from above, because remember, it can be again or above. And then he goes on to say, that which is born of water, uh, you have to be born of the water and the spirit. What is born of flesh is flesh. What is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born from above. What's Jesus saying here? Jesus is saying, even though you do all these things as a good Pharisee, you, you know, in the modern, you attend the right church, you follow all of uh, the rules, you listen to the teachings and you uh, keep them, etc., etc., etc. There's a fundamental problem that you have is what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying that unless you're born from above, it's not going to count for anything. What Jesus is saying is that you are spiritually dead. 
And Paul also talks about this in Ephesians 2. He says we are dead in our sins, that spiritually we are not alive before God, not even a little bit. And the way that Jesus puts it here is even stronger than that. He says that you have to be born from this, uh, the Spirit. You have to be born of the Spirit, just like you're born of uh, the water of your mother's womb. Uh, what gives birth to flesh is uh, flesh. And it's not something that you can control, by the way. You can't control when you're going to be born naturally, right? You can't, uh, you know, once uh, you're in the womb, you know, decide, you know, Mom, I think 3 a.m. is a really good time uh, for your, the water to break and you have to go to the hospital. You know, no baby decides that. Babies don't even decide to be uh, conceived. It's something they have no control over whatsoever. And Jesus is taking that kind of physical birth and he's li liking it to spiritual birth. He's saying, you in and of yourself cannot do this. You are spiritually dead, and you're even eh, worse off than that because you were never spiritually alive. He's saying you need to be spiritually born. You were never even alive in the first place. That's how dead you are. And like I said, Ephesians chapter 2 talks about that as well. You are deader than dead. You don't get much more dead than that. You were never even alive. Because most of the time when we talk about dead things, we're talking about things that were alive at one point and have since deceased. Jesus puts it even further than that. You were never alive in the first place. So all those things you do, all of those great actions that you have are not going to give you spiritual life in God. Could you imagine how this would be for Nicodemus? He has been taught all of his life, you obey uh, the commandments, you do the good uh, religious things, all this kind of stuff. This is how you get to God. And here's Jesus saying, you're not even there. None of those things that you did uh, gives you spiritual life. Spiritual life comes from above. It's something that you don't have any control over any more than you have control over your own physical birth. You can't decide when you're born. In the same way, you can't decide whether or not you're born from above or not. And this is something that so many people hate. They want to have control over it. I can make myself right with God. There's something I can do in the natural that's going to make me right with God. And Jesus is saying, no, that's not how it works. You must be born from above. You must be born again. Then in verse 8, he uh, describes it a little bit further for Nicodemus. He says, The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. What's he talking about here? He, says, he starts talking about uh, the wind. And by the way, the Greek word for wind is the same Greek word that's used for talking about the Spirit. It's an analogy. It's a, uh, a parable, uh, more or less. He's comparing one to the other. The wind that blows around us, he's likening to uh, the Holy Spirit who gives us life in God. And he says, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. Really? You can't tell if the wind is blowing from the east to the west? We're from the west to the east, or however it might be. You can't tell that? No, that's not what he's talking about. Yes, you can tell where the wind comes from and where it blows, but the word that's used there for no is the same Greek uh, word that's used over in Luke uh, chapter 13, for example, uh, when Jesus uh, looks on people who come to him saying, hey, uh, in the... In the uh, in the day of uh, judgment, they come to him and say, Hey, you, uh, we saw you in our streets, you uh, taught among us, etc., etc. Et and Jesus responds to them by saying, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. It's the same uh, word. And, the new, and what it implies there is a position of having uh, control or power over. That is, when Jesus says, I never knew you, you workers of iniquities, he was saying, You were never under me. You can kind of think of it as an employee and uh, the employer. The employer has power over the employee. That's how the employer would know the employee. The employer knows the employees who are his and has power over them in a sense. This is the same thing that Jesus is talking about in Luke uh, 13. He says, I never knew you. Basically, you were never one of mine. 
And this is the same thing, uh, same word that's being used here in uh, John chapter 3 when it says where you don't know where it comes from or where it goes. He's saying you don't have control over it. You can't decide what the wind is going to do. Yeah, you can look at it and you can feel it and you can see it's going from one direction to uh, the other, but you can't control it. Just like you can't control your own physical birth, just like you can't control the wind, you cannot control whether or not God gives you life. That is a hard teaching for a lot of people uh, to accept, that what I do in the natural isn't going to make things right with God, because in the natural, no matter how many good things you do, the fact of the matter is you will have messed up. Why? Because of that issue of motive that we talked about with King Hezekiah, uh, Hezekiah and also what Jesus talks about in the New Testament. You know, if you've even looked at a woman lusterly, you've already committed uh, adultery in your heart. You've already broken uh, the commandment. You already stand condemned. And you can, you know, do really good things after that. And you can uh, do all these kinds of things, but it doesn't change the fact that it happened. As it says in Romans, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and that the wages of sin is death. Physical, we're all going to die a physical death. And the reason for that is because we're all sinners. And also, except for the grace of God, and this is what Jesus is getting at, we're also all going to die a spiritual death as well. which is a very sobering uh, thought to think about. This is uh, what Jesus is uh, getting at. In and of yourself, you are already under a death penalty. No matter how many things you try to do in the natural, the fact is you've already messed up. You've already been condemned. You're already on death row. And because you're already on death row, how good you are isn't going to matter. You might be the very best criminal on death row, but you're still on death row, and you will still be executed as a criminal. And this, and this is where the good news of the gospel comes into play. But before we get to that, let's kind of back up to where Nicodemus is. It is. He has just heard Jesus telling him that what he does in the natural cannot make him right with God. If he could do it perfectly, that would be one thing. But since it starts in the heart, it's not going to be perfect. What you can do in the natural isn't it. What God does in the spiritual is what uh, what it is. This is a, what he's just heard. He's heard it's what God does, not what I do. And his reaction to it in verse 9 is, how can these things be? He's, we were taught these things. You know, I was taught this as a little kid growing up all the way, all the, my... Uh, People who are with me, who are fellow Pharisees, we've all been taught the same thing. This is how we've always understood it. This is what the people who are over us was telling us. If you're, you know, LDS, and you're talking about, uh, say, the the bishop of your ward and the elders and those kinds of things, this is, or uh, of course the prophet. This is what the people over us have always said. If you're Inglesia and Cristo, this is what the ministers over us have uh, always said. If you're Catholic, with the and what the bishops and archbishops and the popes have always said. This is how we've always understood these things. This is what we have to do to be saved. And how can it be that it's something else? He listens to what Jesus has to say. What I can do in the natural doesn't do anything. Because all that that is, is being a very well-behaved criminal. And granted, it's, it's good to be a well-behaved criminal, but it doesn't change the fact that you're still a condemned criminal who's on death row. This is what's going through Nicodemus' mind. It doesn't matter what I do. He's just so astonished by this. And then, so in verse 10, Jesus answers him, and he says, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you don't understand these things? It's interesting that Jesus says that. Here's a guy who was taught all of his life that this is the way that things are. I do something in the natural, and that can affect my standing with God. And Jesus says, no, it's what God does in the spiritual that affects your uh, standing with God. And the responsibility for knowing that? Jesus puts right back on Nicodemus. He doesn't say, oh, well, you know, I understand that you have been taught wrong, so, you know, there's some, uh, some grace for you. He doesn't say that. He says, you're a teacher of Israel. You should have known this. How is it that he could have known this? Going on into verse 11, what does Jesus say? He says, truly, truly, I say to you, we, 
It's interesting that Jesus uses the plural, though. He says, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you, and he says you in the plural. He's talking about all the leaders of Israel at this point, the Hebrew uh, leaders at the time. He's using it expansively. Those people who are generally seen as being these leaders who are teaching these things, that what you do in the natural is what reconciles you to God. He says, but you do not receive our testimony. What is Jesus talking about? What is this testimony, this witness that has been given to all of these uh, leaders? You know, what's interesting about uh, these uh, different groups, all these different uh, Hebrew groups that existed at the time, there's the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Zealots, the Essenes, and a few other groups um, from the church historian Eusebius. We know that there are at least seven different groups uh, that were in existence at this time, but all of them have one thing in common, and that is that they hold that they are people of the book. They hold to the Old Testament scripture, and especially some with varying degrees, but especially the first five books. Uh, in Protestantism, we usually call it uh, the Pentateuch. Um, if you were more if you were a traditional Hebrew, you would call it the Torah. Uh, but it's the first five uh, books of the Bible, and all of them held to that as being people of the book. They all recognize that this is a superlative standard given uh, by Mo uh, well, actually given by God through Moses uh, that we should all adhere to. They quibbled over some of the other books to a certain extent. And of course, there's whether or not you have the tradition of the elders or not, like the Pharisees had and those kinds of things, but they all recognize at least those first five books. This was the testimony that they all had in common. And Jesus is saying, we speak of what we know. We bear witness to what we've seen, but you do not receive our testimony. What's he talking about? He's saying, we, including himself, are the ones who gave scripture to you. The scripture that all of you leaders have, regardless of what particular sect you happen to belong to, whether it's the Pharisees or the Sadducees or whatever, that primary testimony that all of you depend on, those first five books, comes from us. And in those first five books, if you had studied them carefully, you would know this. Jesus was not teaching a new thing. He wasn't saying, oh, that the message got corrupted, unlike, you know, the Mormons and teach the message got corrupted along the line. Jesus wasn't reinstituting anything. He was saying, you should have already known this because it was sufficiently clear. That is Jesus's rebuttal to Nicodemus's objection. How can these things be, Nicodemus says? This is what we've always been taught. And Jesus says, you're a teacher in Israel. You had the testimony that we gave you. And Jesus is speaking in the plural here. Why? Because Jesus is putting himself on the same level of the Holy Spirit and God uh, the Father, saying, we as a whole have given you this testimony in time past. Which is part of the reason why Protestants believe in the Bible. Now, those of you who are Catholics, you're already, uh, sorry, uh, why Protestants believe in the Trinity. And for those of you who are Catholics, you would agree with us on the Trinity. You would disagree with us about a lot of the other things I've said here, that you are spiritually completely dead without Christ. Okay. Eastern Orthodox Roman Catholic would not teach that, but that is what Christ taught. You are spiritually dead is how Jesus uh, taught it. You need to be born from above. You don't have that in and of yourself. It's not something you can do for self. What you do in the natural isn't it. What God does in the spiritual is it. And how should you have known this? Because we gave you the testimony in the first place, Jesus says. He's putting himself on uh, par with the Holy Spirit and God, uh, the Father, saying, we provided this testimony. And then he uh, goes on beyond that. Even... Even beyond what we've uh, talked about here from Scripture, with the testimony that was given to you in time past that all the different groups had access to, even beyond that, what does he say? He says in verse 12, this is Jesus speaking, he says, okay, yeah, we've already had the testimony of Scripture in the past, but here's also another point to consider, Nicodemus. He says in verse 12, if I have told you earthly things and you have not and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? What's he saying? He's saying, Nicodemus, I just explained to you a very, 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 very simple analogy. I told you that you see the effects of the wind, but you can't control it. You see something that is greater than you, the wind, and you recognize that you can't control it, that you don't know it in that way so as to have authority over it. You know that, Nicodemus. Now, would you say that God is greater than you or not? 
well, yeah, obviously God is greater than you. Then why would you think that your actions here, the natural, can control him? That's what Jesus is saying. You know it doesn't work like that in the natural. Why would you think that it works like that in the spiritual? Now, this is a huge difference, especially between uh, biblical Christians and, say, Mormons, for example. Because what is it that the Mormons often say? Uh, with le and varying levels and a little bit of uh, subtleties there, but they often give the explanation for why they're Mormons and the, and the reason why they accept the Book of Mormon, Joseph Smith and the, as a prophet, and those kinds of things. The reason why uh, they give is they usually say, well, I've received a testimony that these things are true. I prayed about it, received a testimony from uh, God that the Book of Mormon is true, uh, that Joseph Smith is a prophet, that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the one uh, uh, true church, etc., but here's the problem that I would have based on what Jesus said here. In verse 12, he says, If you know that a certain line of reasoning wouldn't work in the natural, why would you think that it would work in the spiritual? So let's take that line of reasoning using the personal testimony of what the Spirit has given us. And we'll see if it works in the natural. Say uh, somebody comes into a gas station and is rather irate, goes up to the counter and says, That pump out there overcharged me. And the gas station clerk is looking at him like, Really? Well, that's not uh, good. What did it charge you? And, and the very irate man says, well, it charged me this, uh, this amount and this amount and this amount. And the gas station clerk looks at it and looks at how many gallons there were and says, you know, that's actually the right amount per gallon. And the irate man looks at him and says, no, I prayed about it. I received a testimony in my heart from the Holy Spirit that the price is only supposed to be one cent per gallon. You overcharged me. Do you think that gas station clerk is going to give him a refund? No, he's not. That's terrible logic. Truth does not depend on your testimony of it. Truth does not depend on your opinion of it. Truth does not depend on whether or not you're convinced of it. That rather irate man at the gas station might be fully convinced in and of himself that does not make him right. It doesn't matter how certain a person is about something, it doesn't make it true. Certainty and truth are not the same thing. You can be 100% certain about something that is a lie, and in the same case, something can be true, and at the same time, nobody would, and, and it might be the case that nobody would believe it. Nobody would be certain about it, even though it is absolutely true. Truth and certainty are not the same thing. When you say that you have a testimony, you're saying that you're certain that it is true, but of course that doesn't work. At least it wouldn't work in the natural, right? You wouldn't accept the man's test, uh, testimony that it should only be one cent a gallon. You know that wouldn't work. Or here's another example that I hear pretty often. You know, people in this day and age uh, believe that it's okay to be rather unchaste, that it's okay to, you know, uh, live with your girlfriend without actually being married to her and having sexual relations uh, with her. And they say that's uh, fine. Well, that's not what scripture uh, says. Even from the Mormon point of view, you would say that that is unchaste behavior and that that is wrong. And if you were to con uh, confront this, per uh, this couple that were doing this on this issue, they might say something like this, well, we've prayed about it to God, and God gave us a testimony that it's okay for us to do this. Would you accept that? No. What is your uh, church teacher? Church teaches you that this is wrong, right? If you're a Mormon, you wouldn't accept it based on their testimony, because you know that God isn't going to be inconsistent. At least, hopefully, your God wouldn't be inconsistent on this. He wouldn't say in church, don't do this, and yet in somebody's personal life, allow them to do it, right? You would say, no, the commandments of God are clear on this. Your testimony does not trump a commandment of God. And you understand that here in the natural right now. So why would you expect biblical historical Christians to be convinced by your testimony regarding what is true in eternity and what is uh, true in the great beyond in heaven? It doesn't work, does it? And that's exactly what Jesus says here. The standards of truth from the natural to the spiritual don't change. If something is logical, reasonable here, it's going to be logical, reasonable in the spiritual. It has to follow through. There has to be a logical cohesion to it. That's what Jesus is talking about there, and this is what he's getting after Nicodemus for. He says, you know that you don't, that the wind has a power that is greater than your, you, and you can't control it. You also know that God is greater than you, therefore you should also believe that you can't control him either, that what you do here in the natural is not going to reconcile you with him. You should know this. And then in verse 13, he continues. He says, No one has ascended into heaven except he who descends from heaven, the Son of Man. 
Why does Jesus talk about that? Well, he's talking about why his testimony is uh, valid. Why he can authoritative slay, uh, authoritatively say that what you do here in the natural isn't going to be sufficient, but what God does in the spiritual is. He's saying, I... He's saying, I have a right to speak about these things because I'm the one who's been to heaven. I'm the one who's been uh, to the dwelling place of God. He says, and nobody else has this right. He says, no one has ascended into heaven except he who has descended from heaven, the son of man. That heaven that he's talking about is the dwelling place of God. This is not where the angels are, because otherwise you couldn't say no one has ascended there, right? He's not talking about the angels. He's not talking about other human beings who have died. Because remember, you know, you have uh, Elijah in the Old Testament being taken up in the uh, whirlwind of fire. If what Jesus is talking about here isn't any of those things, he's not putting himself on uh, the uh, level of mankind who's died and been uh, taken up. He's not putting himself on the level of the angels. He's putting himself in the very highest place, saying, there is only one who's been to heaven, that's me. He is here claiming to be very, 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 very clearly, especially for a Jewish uh, or just general Hebrew audience, he is claiming to be God here. No one has gone into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. This is why I can say these things authoritatively. So you have multiple levels of authority here. You have the testimony that Jesus claims to have co-given along with the Spirit, uh, Holy Spirit and the Father. You have the testimony of the Old Testament scriptures. You have the testimony of the natural world around you. What works there is going to, uh, to work uh, spiritually, and if it doesn't work in the natural, it's not going to work in the spiritual. That's what verse 12 is about. And then there's also the final appeal to authority. Jesus says, I am the one who comes out of heaven. I am God. I'm not like the angels. I'm not like Elijah taken up to heaven. I am the only one who's come down out of heaven. No one else has ascended to that level uh, of heaven in that sense. And the heaven in the Old Testament, sorry, well, actually Old Testament and New Testament, when it talks about heaven, it's not necessarily talking about a future uh, destination, because that's how a lot of us tend to think of it. We think of going to heaven Especially in modern culture, you know, it's this place with, you know, it had fluffy clouds and angels stringing on harps. That's not heaven in the Bible. Uh, talking about heaven in the Bible was talking about what is beyond. And the highest beyond is that which properly only belongs to God. This is what uh, Solomon says when he dedicates the, the temple, for example. He says, but will this tent oh, really contain you for even the heaven and even the highest of heavens cannot contain you? What is has Solomon talking about? He's saying we understand that there's levels that are beyond what we know and we understand, but the one that's beyond them all belongs solely and properly to God. The heavens cannot contain you, not even the highest heaven. You are beyond all of that. This is the kind of heaven that is being talked about here that Jesus claims to have ascended, uh, in, that no one else has ascended into, but he has descended from. He is claiming to come from the dwelling place of God. He is claiming to be God in bodily form. And this is why in the book of Colossians it says that all the fullness of deity dwelt in Christ bodily. This is why we believe in the incarnation, the God-man, that Jesus was fully God or truly God, you might say, who became truly man for our sakes. And then Jesus goes on to explain this. Okay, so you've had this three levels of authority here. You've had scripture. You've had the natural order of things and a natural logic that should have told you that doing something in the natural was faulty. And then you also have the authority of the God who stepped out of heaven for your sake, telling you to your face that this is how this is. And then there's a question that uh, is implicit in that. Because Jesus uh, says there in verse 13, that no one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven the Son of Man. The next question that not logically follows from that is, why did he descend? This is what Jesus explains in verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. What's Jesus saying? He started out by telling Nicodemus that what you do in the natural isn't going to work. It's what God does in the spiritual that and does it. Okay, just as you cannot control whether or not you're physically born, you cannot control whether or not you're spiritually born. And you have to be physically born in order to live. You would say you have to be physically conceived, da 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 da, da. 
in the same way you have to be spiritually born, and it's not something that you have control over. And why is it that Jesus had, had to step into nature, uh, into our physical uh, reality? Why is it that he had to condescend to come into uh, creation himself? Why did God have to become flesh? Because of that problem, because we cannot make ourselves spiritually alive. We are spiritually dead, and in Jesus' phraseology, we're basically deader than dead. We were never even alive in the first place. You have to be spiritually born. And Jesus says, that's what I came to do. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man be, must be lifted up. What's he referencing? Well, in the Old Testament, we read about uh, the Israelites. The Israelites, um, early on, were following Moses, and they didn't always listen to the commandments of God that were given through Moses. Instead, they often went off and did their own rebellious thing. They were stupid. It's was kind of typical for them. And one of the times that they rebelled, God says, I'm going to punish you. You've violated my commandment. What you've done is worthy of death. And so he sent a death sentence upon them. And the way that it was carried out was through the bite of venomous snakes. He basically sent a plague of snakes upon them to carry out this, and this death sentence. And there was nothing that they could do to stop it. you got snakes all over the place and that are biting people and people are dying. Nothing that they could do. They were condemned criminals who all deserve to die. However, God provided a means of grace. He had Moses make a bronze serpent, put it on a pole so that whoever would look to it would have salvation from those um, bites, would not die as a result of them. This is what Jesus is saying he is. He says, I'm the serpent on the pole. I am the means of salvation for convicted criminals who are on death row. Can you imagine how this would be for Nicodemus who's hearing this? He's been taught all of his life that the way that you have a good standing with God, the way that you're reconciled with uh, God is you obey the commandments, you follow uh, the traditions of the elders, etc., etc. You be a good religious person. Make sure you come to church, you pay your tithe, you do all the good stuff. And Jesus says all of that is no different than being the best behaved criminal on death row. You could be as good as you want to be, but you're still a criminal on death row. Why? Because of the issue of motive. Our hearts are not pure. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us have had impure motives or in, uh, pure thoughts in our hearts, etc., etc. And because of that, we all stand condemned, no matter who we are. You can and because you all stand condemned, you're all on death row, and no matter how good you behave, all that you're doing is basically becoming the best criminal on death row, but you're still on death row, and you're still a criminal. And this is what's going through Nicodemus' mind. First, he's told, what I do in the natural cannot affect the spiritual. I do in the natural is not the same thing as God doing it in the spiritual. There's a huge difference there. God has to remake me. God has to step into my life and give me spiritual life, because I can't do it on my own. And then on top of that, he is told that he is like those Israelites who were condemned to a death sentence. He's no better than them is what he's being told. You know how insulting that would be to a Pharisee? Ah, you can't say eh, that. I'm good. I go to church. I do all eh, these kinds of eh, things. I obey the commandments. I follow the elders. Da -da 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 -da. I'm a... I'm doing what I'm supposed to. I'm a good religious guy. And what does Jesus do? He basically slaps him in the faith and says, you are a criminal worthy of death. And I have come to be your bronze serpents. I've come to be the means of salvation. And this is what he goes on and explains in verse 15, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And this is actually an interesting phrase in the Greek. Uh, the phrase where it says, whoever believes is three words in the Greek. It's pas, ha, pistuon. Pas, ha, pistuon. And literally translated, it is each uh, one who is believing. That whoever believes in him may be, have eternal life literally means that each one who is believing in him may have eternal life. A lot of people read this and they think that it's a choice. They, in that, and they read it into the text that whoever chooses to believe in him may have eternal life. That's not what Jesus is saying there. That's not how the Greek reads. That's not the emphasis. The emphasis isn't on the choice to believe. The emphasis is on the kind of belief. Each one who is believing. 
And this is a very important uh, thing in general for a lot of uh, people, and even a lot of misconceptions about biblical historical Christianity. People think that biblical historical Christians, you know, just, you know, invite Jesus into their heart, say a little prayer, and then they go out and do whatever. Because, you know, we don't uh, believe that what you can do in the natural is going to change the spiritual, right? Well, what does it say? It says each one who is believing. It's not who believed at one time in the past. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say that someone who you know, lived a terrible life and then at the end of their life decided that they want to get right with God, said a quick little prayer before they died and then they're okay. It doesn't say that. It says each one who is believing, it's talking about a quality of uh, faith that starts from the inside out that completely changes who the person is. And this is what Jesus was talking about. You have to be born from above. Remember that same word that can be translated as again can also be translated as from above. You have to be born from above. And it gives you a new spiritual life that completely changes everything. And guess what? Those people who have that new spiritual life, they are going to do the things that correspond with the law of the Lord as much as uh, they can, as much as you know the flesh enables us to. And we are to mortify, uh, be mortified by our sin and to to hate it, to to detest it, yes. But we have to recognize that fighting that sin in our lives is not the same thing as being reconciled with God. And it, and it makes sense if you think about it. If you've done something against someone else, you can do all the things that you want to to uh, be right uh, with them. You know, you can give them gifts, you can say that you're sorry, you know, you can wash their car for them and walk the dog and all those kinds of things, but that doesn't guarantee that the relationship is going to be reconciled. Why? Because that person has to forgive you. And this is the same thing. You can do all these things in the natural that you want to, and it's not going to reconcile you with God in and of itself. No, he has to make a change in you because you're spiritually dead. That's what Jesus is teaching here. You're spiritually dead, and so he's going to do something in you. And when he does something in you, Guess what's going to happen? Your life is going to change, and it's going to change to reflect him. And yes, you are going to do what the Bible wants you to do. But it's not going to be because you're trying to earn your way to heaven. Instead, it's going to be because heaven is going to come pouring out of you. It's a huge difference between the two. Biblical Christians believe that we are saved by faith alone, but the faith that saves is never alone. That's one of Luther's favorite uh, fa uh, uh, famous lines. Yes, we are saved uh, by faith alone. We are saved by that believing faith, not just choosing uh, to believe. Okay, that's not what the text is talking about. It doesn't say whoever chooses to believe. That's nowhere in the text. That's not the emphasis. The emphasis is on the present active uh, tense. Each one who is believing in him may have eternal life. It's not... Oh, I said this quick little prayer over here uh, when I was born and, uh, you know, not when I was born, but, you know, as a little kid, I said this one little prayer and got baptized. And so I'm good. It's not, oh, no, I've lived a terrible life and I really, really, really don't want to go to hell. So I'm going to say a prayer and get out of it. OK, I'll put it this way. Jesus is the king. And the king knows the difference between someone who wants to get out of the tor his torture dungeons and someone who actually wants to be his subject. And that's what verse 15 is talking about. It's not just a matter of getting out of the torture dungeons. It's not just a matter of having a nice, secure eternity, of getting to go to the celestial level of glory. He's saying, do you want to be my subject? Is your belief a present act of faith of me working through you? It is a renewal that comes from God, not from man, so that no one can boast. That is also talked about in Ephesians chapter 2, by the way. Okay, so that's um, John chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. I don't think that most of you will have heard uh, will have heard of that before, or seen what was uh, there, because it's usually not commonly taught. They don't go through, in most of those other groups that I've talked about, like uh, Inglésia and Christo, or the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons or even the Catholics and the Eastern Orthodox, they don't go through and ask the question, what do each one of these verses mean in context? What's it talking about? Why uh, is there this comparison between being born of the flesh and being born of the spirit? And why is it that Jesus is so adamant that you have to be born of the spirit? 
He's saying that you're not even alive spiritually. Why is that important? He says that what he's doing is like uh, the serpent that Moses lifted up. What was that situation? It was one of a death sentence. It was in the context of a death sentence given to the Israelites. And Jesus is saying the same applies to you. And I'm here. I've come so that that death sentence could be pardoned. And guess what? You can't pardon yourself. There is only one hope of salvation, and that is Jesus Christ. No amount that you can do, no amount of good, in the, in the words of Martin Luther, good, no amount of good monkery, no amount of religiosity, no amount of staying true to the, to the teachings of your church, etc., etc., can do it except for Christ, who died on the cross for you, who was raised up for you to be your means of escaping that death penalty. And yes, you can be the very best uh, criminal on death row, but you are still on death row unless you are pardoned from above. Does that mean the biblical historical Christians believe that you should go out and do whatever uh, you want to uh, once uh, God has uh, saved you, once you've come to, uh, to faith in Christ? No. Like we said, it is not a matter of choosing to believe, but rather it is an indwelling belief. Each one who is believing a faith that permeates your very existence, not so that you can get into heaven, but because heaven is coming down out of you. Huge difference, an amazing difference. For all of you who are in Christ, I pray that you would go with God and be blessed. For those of you who are not, I would pray that you come to a saving knowledge of the true Christ of history, the only genuine Savior of mankind. Amen.